and welcome to this morning's seminar. We have a very special guest with us here today, Scott Hunt. Scott Hunt is a sustainable living designer, uh, engineer specializing in off-grid water and energy systems. He's the owner of Practical Preppers and a consultant to National Geographic and Retreat Design. Yeah, he's also an experienced homesteader and a welder. Please give a warm welcome to Scott Hunt. Good morning, folks. Good to be with you. It's great to be back. Thank you, Zach, for the intro. And uh, great to be back at Morningside. Um, every time I come here, this is my second time here. It's an amazing, hospitable place. The hospitality is bar none here. So we enjoy coming and being able to share. And today, is, uh, it's exciting for me to teach two seminars this week. The first one will be on water, as Zach said. And then the next one will be tomorrow morning on energy. And um, again, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a little bit of background, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and I grew up in a non-Christian environment, and so I never heard about Jesus, never had a Bible until I was 26 years old. The Lord knew what he, how to reach me, and he basically recruited me to work as an engineer for Michelin Tire Corporation in South Carolina, and the first day on the job, I was confronted with, are you saved? Are you born again? Are you ready to go? And I'm like, where am I? I've definitely made it into the Bible Belt. And so for two years, I fought with everybody at work. And it was a wonderful place afterwards. But when I first got there, it was horrible because everybody wanted to get me saved. And I didn't know Jesus and I didn't understand. So I decided to, as an engineer, analyze the Bible in my arrogance, try to find fault with the Word of God. That's pretty arrogant, isn't it? And so I did that. And it was a wonderful experience. After two years of looking into His Word, into this mirror, I found out that I desperately needed to be saved. And so, and so praise the Lord. So, so I've had a lot of neat experience as an engineer. I became a pastor. I got saved at Michelin Tire Corporation, never been in church, never raised in church. I just had the Bible. So I got fascinated by the Word of God and started to study and teach it in a verse-by-verse -verse fashion. And then ended up putting my resignation in and said, I'm, I have to go teach the Bible. So they're like, what is wrong with you? I said, well, I have to go. It's just, I have to go. And so I went and started, uh, we started a church, Calvary Chapel, in Pickens, South Carolina, and been teaching the Bible ever since, uh, verse by verse. But then there came a point where it, dynamics, things in the world were just, you know, people were getting fearful, and, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there's just a lot of things going on in this world. I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you doing with me? What am, I have this mechanical engineering background. Um, I've been a farmer all my life, too. So I've been farming and engineering and then pastoring, and I'm like, what does this mean? What do you want to do with me? So I start this, the preparedness movement began, you know, five, six years ago, people really doing it. I said, I've been doing this stuff for 20 years. I've been moving water around, pumping water around for my chickens and my cows and showing farmers how to do this in an off-grid fashion, drilling wells by hand in Nicaragua and just doing a lot of things water and energy related. Because it was a hobby, it was fun for me. So when people really started to look at things going on in the world and said, what can we do? I said, I know, I'm doing it. Come to my farm and we'll show you how to move water, how to find water, how to purify water, and how to move it around and store it. And so my focus is not on any one scenario, whether it's cyber attack, EMP, financial crisis, natural disaster. I'm always telling people you need water, you need food, you need sanitation, you need some security. And we go through a long list, and I have a lot of that covered in our book. And so the talk today on water will basically parallel my book on disaster preparedness. But I don't focus, because people ask me, what's the timing of things? What do you think? What's going to happen? What's it going to be? I don't know. It's Ebola or a Zika one week, and then it's cyber attack the next. It doesn't matter. It, what matters is, is that you do something and that you don't get overwhelmed in the process of preparedness. And so, very important that we, we do that. I'm just make sure we're, okay, we're running here. So, um, so I started doing this and helping people prepare. And I just want to share one story from the Bible that I think is very unique and uh, intriguing. It's always been intriguing to me. Everybody's familiar, most of you are probably familiar with the um, Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. 
And it's basically Jesus' answer to the disciples. What's going to happen? How are, the, how are the, all the stones going to be removed from the Temple Mount? What are the signs of your coming? And Jesus gives this amazing prophetic sermon in the Olivet Discourse. Well, in Luke 21, 20, he tells one, it's unique to the Gospel of Luke. He says that when you see, he talked to the Jewish believers, when you see Jerusalem encompassed about by armies, that you're, and they're gonna, you're going to be in the midst of it. You're going to be surrounded by armies. He tells them, which is very odd, he says, leave. Now, how can they leave? It always like scratched my head. Well, how can they leave if they're surrounded by armies? Well, history tells us in 66 AD, the great Jewish revolt happened, and Cestius Gallus came with the Roman armies, and they laid siege to Jerusalem. This is before 70 AD in 66 to put down that rebellion, and they surrounded Jerusalem, but they forgot something. They didn't have enough provisions to actually lay an effective siege against the Jews there in Jerusalem. So when they laid siege, the Jewish believers, the believers in Jesus Christ as their Messiah, re remembered what Jesus said, get out of here, flee, get, a get out of Jerusalem. And so when Cestius Gallus realized, we don't have enough provisions, we've got to go back to Rome, the armies dissipated, they went back. That was the sign that Jesus told them in Luke 21. And what did the believers do? They left. They went to a town. They set up a community in Pella on the Transjordan. They went east of the Jordan and they went there. And guess what happened after that? Titus Vespasian comes in in 68 AD and lays siege to Jerusalem with all the provision. What did they do? They killed over a million and a half Jews in Jerusalem. Who escaped that difficult time? Who escaped? It was Jewish believers. Those that believed the Word of God, those that believed the sign that Jesus gave them, they retreated, so they went to their Pella. So for the last five or six years, I feel like I've been helping people make their Pellas work for them, giving them the water, their, their food, their provisions, the advice, teaching, techniques that they can do. And everybody's Pella is a little bit different. You might be in a, an apartment in downtown Manhattan. How do I prepare? Can I actually survive? Yes, you can. Or you might be in the wilderness, the mountains of Idaho or Montana, and everybody has a different Pella. So I've been going around helping people prepare their place, and it can just be where they're at, or it can be their bug out location in the mountains. It really doesn't matter to me what the structure is. Do you have the provisions? So I keep harping on, do you have water? Do you have good water? Can you take a hot shower? Maybe you need some air conditioning, or maybe you just, you know, we, we, we want to start simple. I tell people, prepare like you are living in the 1800s. We're very used to electricity. We're used to creature comforts. I just start pre preparing like you're in the, in, in the 1800s where you don't have electricity. And then we'll begin to add to your preparedness skills and equipment things that will help you greatly. So I'm going to cover a, a lot of things. I won't be able to cover everything I want. And in this, this slide, I'm basically showing um, ways that you can see. I've got like 500 videos on YouTube. If you just want to, if you have trouble sleeping, just turn on my YouTube channel, put you right out. It's just not a problem. But there's a, I go into a lot of techniques and technical things because I'm an engineer and I can't help myself. But it's fun to explain to people how to do things they don't know how to, how to do in terms of how to stay alive, how to stay prepared, and uh, stay healthy. A lot of it is you know, just keeping your morale high. If, I'm, if, we're, if I can stay clean and hydrated and get a good night's sleep, the, the group that I'm working with, we're gonna, all going to do a lot better. I experienced this in, a, in disaster relief like in Katrina when super hot, cutting trees, chainsaws up on roof, and we're all dirty. And I brought my laundry equipment, my off-grid laundry equipment, my water filtration devices, and we were able to do laundry every day. We cut wood all day long, but then we were able to stay clean and stay hydrated so nobody would get hurt. But morale, we saw other teams just not doing well, getting hurt, and it's very dangerous when you're, you're just not, you're not getting enough sleep, you're using equipment you've never used before, it can be a dangerous time. So let's jump in here. Um, what to do before the tap runs dry um, is kind of the title of my talk here today. And I'm going to break it into three simple areas. Water that you would store, and how to get water from a, uh, whether it's a well, a spring, or maybe it's even a municipal water supply, a river, a creek, it doesn't matter, a rain catchment, we'll talk about that. And then how can you purify or disinfect, or we'll go through 12 or so ways that you can do, do that. And hopefully you'll have some questions for me as well. So as we go forward here, how do you store water? What can you do to store water? It's very important. Even though I have wells, I got multiple wells and springs and uh, water on my, on my property. My, you know, my dad said, if you ever buy a piece of property that doesn't have water on it, I'll disown you. So this has kind of been ingrained in me from an, to make sure when you have a piece of property that you have a good water source on it. 
We're fortunate in most places in the United States you can drill a well. If you can afford to, that's a good, secure source of water. Some of you are very, might be very fortunate to have a gravity-fed spring. That's a very unique, hard thing to find these days as we're in such a developed country. But to have gravity-fed water is, very, is an awesome thing. Well, let's get back to storage. How many people are actually, are you storing water? We talk about, so great, so at least half of you are storing water. It's very important, even though you say, I have a well, or I have this and I have that, it's very important that you have water. Just from a security standpoint, if I have water inside my shelter, I don't have to go out and be vulnerable to anybody out there that might harm me or harm any of my loved ones or even give away that I'm even there. So I still store a lot of water in my, in my house, and there's, there's some, just some tips and tricks I want to share with you on how to store water. You can store water in a variety of ways. If you don't have the money, I mean, two-liter soda bottles is how I started storing water. It's, you know, just using things that you can find that are inexpensive and ways to store it. But you can get real creative. They make all sorts of tanks, and um, there's one tank here, this doorway tank that I've shown. It, you, it's, it holds 400 gallons. So even if you don't have a well, if you don't have your own water supply, you still have water coming to your dwelling, you can store that water, whether it's city water, county water, store it and treat it. Um, I like to use 55-gallon drums that are stored away. I use a two-part solution called Aquamira. That water is good for five years. At the end of the five-year mark, I can drink that water and nobody's going to get sick. Um, it's been tested to seven years, but most people say, you know, it's good for five. So if you want a long-term water storage solution, you basically start with as good a water source as you can come up with, add the two-part solution to it, and you've got a five-year water storage solution there. And as a rule of thumb, I like to tell people to have at least two gallons per person per day for 90 days to start out. So you have potable water for drinking, for cooking, and just sanitation, hygiene, to have at least two gallons per person. That's just a rule of thumb, and you can, the numbers you can add to it I'll take away. I just like to, my kind of the rule of thumb and looking at everybody's preps, I go to a lot of people's places and they want me to assess how they're doing and try to just, you know, score them and see how they're doing and just say, well, you're a little, you're, you know, there's no, there's not enough water here. There's not enough food here. You think you have two years supply of food, but if you count the calories, you're really about 800 calories a day for that amount. That's not, a, that's not going to be good enough. So we make those kinds of just simple mathematical assessments of where they're at. And a lot of people don't have enough water stored, and they, they don't have enough food stored either and, uh, for the time period that they have picked. I let them pick it. I mean, I'm, my goal is to try to get everybody prepared for about a year. But there's some people who are like, no, just give me three, I want to do three months, and some people are five years. So I just kind of shoot for that year. This is how much food you're going to need. This is how much water you're going to need. So there's so many ways to store. I'm not going to tell you how to store it necessarily because there's so many ways to do it. 55-gallon drums, you can buy... Good potable water tanks from 50 gallons all the way on up to, you know, five, ten thousand 10,000 gallons if you want. And um, so you, they can be buried tanks. They can be above ground cisterns. Um, there, there's, there's, you can go on the internet and find tanks anywhere. You can find tanks. There's local suppliers in, in almost everybody's town that sell these types of tanks. Just make sure if you can, it's uh, the BPA free and the, they're potable. They're actually, because they'll say non potable water or potable. Just get the potable water tanks. They're really, they used to be about a dollar a gallon, but you can get them for 50 cents or less than that now for, for um, these, these large tanks. So, and then, you know, things that you might not think of as water storage devices, swimming pools. Some people have bought, the, you know, cheap inflatable pools that'll hold three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 gallons of water. Um, that's a great way to, to store water. Sometimes the swimming pool. The swimming pool for me was such an aggravation because I always had, I never swam in it. It was just for the kids. Keeping it clean, keeping it maintained. And I said, hey, that's an awesome prep right there. I know some of you know Dr. Forsh, and he wrote one second after. The main character in that book was able to stay alive and take care of his family. Why? Because he had a swimming pool. And that water is kind of already treated. It was a chlorinated pool. It's already treated. And if you just filter that water after that, you're good. So if you have 20,000 gallons of water sitting there, so I, now I don't, I don't mind my swimming pool. That's a great prep. It's also a great firefighting device. So you think about, you know, I've got to be my own water plant, my own power plant, my own medical team, firefighting, because they might not be able to get to where I am. So you start thinking about ways that you can do these things. So just, you know, Think about what you have for resources and how would you act in a grid-down situation. My children hate it when I do off-grid weekend. 
you know, it's exciting for me. We say, we're going to pull the plug. We're going to turn the power up. No. And I said, we're going to do laundry off grid. And, you know, think of three teenage girls, how they like that. Uh, they, it's, it's, a rough, it's a rough time. So I kind of backed up. I said, we're just going to do laundry. I just want to make sure you know how to do this, how you, that you know how to take care of yourself. And so we, we do those things. So I encourage everybody to practice or put in place. A lot of people buy things. I go to their homes and I assess them and they've never pulled that device out of the box and actually run it. So they don't know what it can do. Please practice your preps. Pull those things out of there and, and, and know that it works and know how to store the water. And when you're in a crisis situation, you're not going to want to have to do, pull these things out of the box and try to figure them out. So, so storage. A couple of customers I went to just as an example. A Texas couple I went and visited, did an assessment, but they had been catching rainwater on their property. Well, their community well went down, and it was down for a long period of time, and they went 120 days with the water that they caught off their roof, and they were able to do it. And I, I, was, I commended them. I said, that is awesome, that you're doing exactly what you need to do. If you ever run into the situation again, you know that you can make it 120 days with the water that you caught off your, different, off of, uh, off your structures on your property. So that was a lot of fun. A customer close to me, um, their pump went out. Sometimes there's pump failures. I think even Morningside had one recently at an expo. There was a, your water tank went out. I got to talk to Pastor Jim about getting a solar water pump for you folks and getting that a backup system. When I do water systems for wells, which I'll get into next, I always have two or three ways, redundancies, backups. When one pump fails, I can turn the other one on and keep going, even if it's less water. I do this for campgrounds and stuff where they, they use a lot of water, but I always have a backup system where they can conserve, but it's nice to know that you at least have some water no matter what happens. So I have customers where pumps go out, there's electrical failures, ice storms, what have you, and they still live the same way they're living now. They flush the commode every time they use it. They use a lot of, they don't think about it. So we put hand pumps on their wells. Some of the wife called me and said, you're killing my husband. He's, he's out there just pumping like crazy, pumping water. I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, we're just living the way we normally do. I said, well, you know, you no, no longer have electricity. You have to conserve. <laughs> you know, and he's getting a good workout out there, but stop, you know, using as much water. Now you're doing it by hand. It's great that you, have, you don't have to leave your location because you have water. That's good. You just have to change your lifestyle a little bit. So I say all to say practice filtering water, storing water, how are you going to work with the water? And, and then rotating that out, making sure that it is safe for those to drink. Having redundancies for your water storage plan and your filtration plan. Having backups to backups is very important. So let's talk a little bit about, that's enough on storage. Let's talk about sources of water that you can have at your location and what can you do with those sources of water. A lot of people don't, they might, you might have a well, but you don't know anything about your well. So in a crisis situation, how am I going to get water out of this well that was drilled 30, 40 years ago or whatever, 10 years ago? So we're going to talk about wells. We're going to talk about springs. We're going to talk about rain catchment and then some ground sources of water that you can use and then ways to get water out of these, out of these devices. So the first one, most people, the, the graphic on the, on the left is your traditional well where a pump is turned on based on your usage and it pumps water to a bladder tank. Here at Morningside, it's pumped to an elevated tank, which is my favorite way to use water. Just you pump water up and use gravity to distribute that water. But in most homes, you have a bladder tank. So if there's no power, that pump's not running, you don't have water. What do you do? So on the, the graphic on the right shows a solar pump in a well. This is kind of my favorite. I've been doing this for about 15, 16 years and pumping water using sunlight it, and pumping it up to an elevation and then gravity feeding. So I'm just using the resources that are on that property. I'm using sun and gravity and being able to live completely off grid. So all of my cows, a lot of farmers in our area, I've set them up to do this. So the agricultural techniques I use work really well for those, for people that are, that are prepping. And so this is one of my favorite things. So I started, 20 years ago, saying, all this water is below me. How do I get this water out of this crevice, out of this darkness? And I thought, well, isn't that what Jesus did? The Son of God lifted me up out of darkness into this marvelous light. And that's what I go around doing, lifting this water up out of darkness with the sunlight to move it around. The most efficient use of solar energy is actually pumping water. Not many people realize that. Super efficient. So I can take and I can direct drive a pump 
pump water up to an elevated plane, and then gravity feed a homestead, a house, a cabin, a, a, a business. Um, a, you know, something like, like Morningside could easily do something like this. So, all right, so getting water out of wells. Another thing you can do, you know, I, I don't usually go to somebody and say, pull this out and start over with what I recommend. No, I just add to or put systems in parallel with what you already have. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's kind of like, hey, your system works, but only works if you have electricity. What if you don't have electricity? How can I get water out of this well? So I've gone around installing these hand pumps that will reach down to 325 foot static. And most, the average static water level in the United States is 50, 55 feet. I know that varies depending on where you live, but for the most case, this is a pretty simple mechanical EMP proof solution is to just hand pump. And this isn't grandma's hand pump that you pitch your pump you used to prime on the farm. This is a positive displacement pump. The piston's in the water. When you push down, water's forced up. Not only that, we tie it in with existing plumbing, so you have put the water where you need it. You put the water in the kitchen sink, you put the water in the commode, in the bathtub, and you can, and you can get water like that, five gallons a minute. And, and if you want to get fancy, there's a motor attachment you can add to it as well. If you have a shallow well, there's a pump that I love to use. It's an Italian pump. I've looked all over the place for these kinds of pumps where you can actually pump back and forth. It's a bilge pump. It's a pump used in the marine application, but it works fantastic for a shallow well surface, so a well, uh, shallow well source. And so picture you've stored water in a thousand gallon tank and it's city water. You don't have a well and you're just like, okay, I want water stored and I've stored it. I'd like to get, how do I get that water from that tank into my house? or wherever I want to take it. This is a kind of a great pump that you can plumb from having it inside your shelter, plumbed out to your tank, and pressurize, take a, hot, take a shower, um, and move water around. So we've done a lot of those. People that live along the coast typically have a higher static water level, and some of the shallow water solutions work really, really good for that. And then um, back to solar water pumping, there are um, pumps that are shallow well pumps too that are solar direct driven. Old pumps, pumps from, that have technology from the 50s, but they have a DC motor that I can run off of solar panels. They're so reliable. I have this little blue pump, it's 27 years old, and it just works fantastic. It's off-grid, it's super efficient, got more water than I need. So there's a lot of things that people don't realize because of the, we're all connected to the grid, and we've just done it this way for a long time. But just, I just wanted you to know there's a lot of solutions out there to get you water. And, you know, because my goal is the more that you're, you're hydrated, you're, you have good potable water, you can spend time on other things that you need to do. Preparing food, taking care of other people, doing charity, doing, pulling security, you name it. So if these things are taken care of, your power and your water and your food are taken care of, then you can spend time on those other things. Springs. Springs are a fun, you know, a great natural source of water that... It used to be developed, used to be refrigeration for a lot of people. They would develop a spring, develop a spring house, and they would put their, their milk and their butter and stuff in their spring house. Well, there's, there's some new techniques, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. If you have a spring on your property, most people don't know they do, uh, or they see this wet area that's all been sedimented in over the years. If that spring is developed, that is a great source of water. That was the first thing I did when I got to my property was develop a spring. And she's still running, and she takes care of a lot of our livestock, and it's just, I don't need a pump. It just runs naturally out of the ground. You capture it, you collect it, but there's certain techniques to do that. And there's a neat system um, that we use, this little spring box collection system. It's under $300, and it will collect that spring, prevent any runoff from getting into it. It filters the water, and you could be living off of that spring for forever. Even if you didn't pump it, you could still get to that water. It's, I'm not like dipping in a creek or a pond and having to worry about the bacteria in that water source. Okay, springs are are wonderful, wonderful if you have them. And the next thing is rain catchment, rain harvesting. This is just a simple graphic of rain hitting a roof. It can be a tarp, it can be an RV, it can be a house, it can be a home, any type of building. And you're capturing the water off of that structure and taking it to your final point of use. Some people just take water off their roof and catch it in a barrel. And within a month, it is really bad. If you've done it, it's just really, and if it's just for gardening, it's great. But if you're going to try to survive off of this, there's some things I wanted to share with you to consider. And this is one of the most reasonable um, cost-wise uh, solutions is rain harvesting because most people living in a structure has a roof on it. For whatever the square footage of your roof is, take half of that. So if it's a 1,000 th square foot structure, about 500 gallons of water 
will be, you can catch per one inch of rain. So it's amazing how fast your rain barrels will fill up. And, but as they fill up, before they fill up, I want you to consider a few things. So what's happening here is the rain hits the roof. It's going, the first thing you want to do is go through a first flush diverter. What I want to happen, I want to rinse that roof from what was ever on the roof, the birds and the bugs and, and out of my gutters, all the pollen and the bugs and everything that they've left there. I don't want that going in my rain barrel that I'm actually going to filter and drink. So I use a first flush diverter. A lot of this stuff is reasonable, $35 on Amazon. And I wanted to show you, well, this is a picture of like my, my shop where I catch every bit of water off of the roof through these first flush diversion um, pipes that are on the end. So when it rains, it flushes and rinses my roof, fills these tubes up. They automatically reset. I don't have to do anything with the system. It works automatically. They're $35 for the first flush diverter kits. And let me show you one and how it works. We won't go into the gory details on the math here because that's boring. But here, so you have dirty water coming down the, off your roof. It fills, starts filling a first flush diversion, diverter. The ball rises and it checks. You see the water's getting cleaner and then the clean water is taken, taken out. Now after it's done raining, this tube, this vertical tube actually drains out. It has a little orifice in it and it drains out and resets. So you're ready for the next rain. But in the meantime, you've done a very simple thing. It's just diverting the dirty water into this tube. And the tube is sized to match your square footage of your home or your building. So, so this is the first line of defense is uh, catching good rainwater if you want to do this. Because my goal was, could I live off of the, could I f take care of the six people in my family off of this one roof? And I could. I can do 140 gallons a day on average based on where I live at 55 inches of rain a year. I could actually survive off of my roof and not go anywhere for water. And so these are some of the techniques that would allow me to do that. So I won't go into too much of the detail on that. Um, but some of the, t there's, you, you're not going to find this stuff at Lowe's. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or a box store or hardware store, there's places like North American Rain Harvesting you can go to and you can get these kinds of um, devices that aren't expensive. They're just not found readily. Here's a picture, a video of uh, the skimmer. This, and in this previous slide, I show this overflow siphon. This basically is a P-trap. So anything that gets through my first diversion, it's gotten through my gutter guard, it's gotten through my first flush diverter, and now it's in my rain tank. But there's still some floating particles, pollen, maybe some bugs got through. Well, I'm going to skim them off in this overflow siphon that's in my rain tank. And you can see it's kind of the water flowing over the edge, and that just flushes out. As it rains again, it just flushes, flushes out. So it's a really neat way to take anything floating out of that tank. So my goal is how clean can I make this tank of rainwater? And rainwater, there's people live off rainwater forever. And there's people that still do. I have customers, that's what they do. They live off of rainwater because that's all they can catch. The sad thing is you get arrested in some states now for catching rainwater on your own roof, and that's pretty sad. So while, it's still, while you still can do it, do it. And, you know, that's just, it's crazy. But anyway, that's... Uh, this is a great technique that's been used forever to stay alive is catching rainwater. There's another neat thing as a floating extractor. The cleanest area in any tank, I don't care if you've got a pickle barrel, 55-gallon barrel, a very sophisticated cistern system for collecting rainwater, the cleanest zone to actually get water from is four inches below the top of the surface. You don't want to pull from the bottom of a tank. You don't want to pull from the top. So, and if, so if this is all sophisticated, you can still just run your water into your pickle barrel. I'm okay with that. At least you have water. I'm just letting you know this is some fancy things you can do to help you in the long run so that the water you're starting with, it's like starting with good food, starting with good fuel. I want you to start with good water before you have to filter and clog up all your filters that you've bought. And then, okay, now I've got my rain, my tank, I, I've, I'm skimming it, I'm pulling water off the cleanest area, now what do I do with it? You can actually, and I do, I pump it into, with a solar pump through the house and pressurize it, and I run it through my last stage, and there's a lot of filters on here, and I don't want to bore you to death with the filtration. I do some particle filters that are just screens that I can flush out, back flush filters, and this is all readily available stuff from a hardware store, except for the last thing, which is a ceramic filter. Kind of like, you know, you have the, the Seychelles. You, there's so many water filters on the market that have some sort of ceramic technology to keep bacteria out of your water. You can do this in a whole house fashion. 
You can do an adult water filter. It's got six ceramic candles in it. So all the water is being pumped through the ceramic and no bacteria is getting through. So I drink this water. So the water that comes off my roof is perfectly safe to drink. But I did a lot of work to get there. Now, you could just catch it in a barrel and filter it. But, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, people are going to drink this. They're not going to filter it. They're going to forget something. And I'm trying to cover them in case they make a mistake. We don't want anybody getting sick. Okay, Rusco spin downs. I won't... There's a lot of details on how to do this, and we won't have to cover that. Now, if you, only have, if, you come, if you only have access to groundwater, maybe you had to leave your location. Look at those people in Can on Canada today. I mean, there's 80,000 people evacuated. There's no, it's not a cyber attack. It's a fire. So we never know what the scenario is going to be. But there's 80,000 just very distraught people in Canada right now having to leave a town. And what do they have? So I always, you see... And I don't like traveling. I don't like flying because I, I have to repack this thing for TSA every time I go someplace. This is not how I would travel normally because there's things in here that they won't let me. They'll throw me in jail over if I go on the plane with them. But these, you know, having a bag that I repack that's safe for travel, I make sure that I have ways to have water, not only water storage, but be able to filter to have some sort of filtration on me. And I want to have a couple hundred gallons worth of uh, filtration's easy. And then I also have ways to start a fire, and I can boil, distill, pasteurize water. That's important, too, to be able to start a fire. So, so it's not just water for your dwelling, but what if I had to leave? There's, you know, a lot of, you know, and those people are getting a lot of support from government agencies and, and re relief organizations right now, but you might not have those, and so you need to rely on yourself. So when you come across the stream, the river, the lake, and the pond, please don't just drink that water because you're not going to have enough antibiotics on board to take care of you know, the possible giardia, the cysts, and, and, you know, bacterial infections that come from it. So you want to be able to treat that water in some way. Okay. Uh, some of the, you know, I love old technology. I'm going to take you back to the 1700s now. So this, I go back, the way water was moved around in the United States, in England, in the 1700s, 1800s, was mechanically. EMP proof, no electricity, nothing, of course, electronic and they just worked. And so one of the things I wanted to share was some, some other things that you can be thinking about if your property is conducive to that, that you have using a hydraulic ram pump. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but a hydraulic ram pump, oh, is it going to run? It's not going to run. A hydraulic ram pump is a device that actually uses falling water. I had a little animated video here. I thought it would work, but it's, uh, it, would, it actually pumps water Oh, there she goes. She's awake now. Um, but that pump I've had running since 1998. It pumps about 2,000 gallons a day up a mountain. It pumps for free, and it waters my chickens. So it saves me from having to go water my chickens. And it just pumps the water out of there. I've got them that pump 500 feet straight in the air, pump for miles. Um, it's how water was moved in the United States, like I said, before electricity came out. A lot of municipal water supplies were using these, and then electricity came out and couldn't compete. But there's a lot of stuff for people that are preparing that are, that's old school technology that works fantastic, super reliable. I've never had to do anything to this pump. I took it apart one day after 20 years because I wanted to see how, you know, I just wanted to paint it and make it look better. But it's a pump that just is, runs and runs and runs. In the 18, late 1800s, they came out with a pump that would actually, you could use your dirty water, your groundwater, to pump the clean spring water that you had. It was a double acting ram. And New York City's water supply system was going to be run that way. They were pumping using hydraulic ram pumps, water up to a tower. So a lot of my customers come to me and say, I want an EMP proof solution. And they show me the lay of the land and we design a system. A lot of times I've integrated these. I, one gentleman had a spring. We ran the water down to a ram pump. We pumped it up the mountain into a buried cistern and then back down to his house. He's on 55 PSI of spring water, this whole house, and it's done with a mechanical ram pump from the late 1700s. It's a lot of fun to, to do that. And this is kind of the design of his system that I did is taking the green boxes, the spring, I run the water down to a ram, it rams it back up and brings it back down. The closest thing I've ever found to a perpetual motion machine is the RAM. Mine's been running since 98. The only time it stops is I did have my filter clogged and I got a fish that came down my pond and got in the pipe. And I'm like, why is my RAM pump not working? And I opened it up and I had a fish stuck in my RAM pump. So my filter was bad. So there's, there's always failures, but good thing we had backups. We had other pumps running at the same time. So, but there, there's always something that can go wrong. So, um, Here's a river pump. Maybe you don't have falling water, but you just have a little stream that, that is flowing. 
And these pumps have been around forever. These are Archimedes screw pumps. They're, they're air pumps. They, they turn in the river. I had a better graphic of this. I wish I showed that to you. But that pump is just spinning. It's got a prop, a high-pitched prop, like a boat prop on the front. And the water's coming down and hitting that, and it's turning. And as it turns, it picks up water. It picks up air. picks up water. So the air actually lifts the water. So I can pump water miles away, 80 foot in elevation. Oh, there she goes. And she's, she's spinning in the, in the river, and she's pumping water a mile away from where it's spinning there to a farm to take care of their goats and their gardening and filling a tank so that they'll have pressure um, and they can gravity feed their farm. So neat devices, they've been around forever, great. The, a lot of this stuff is good. It's been, you know, start, I start thinking about how do we help people in third world countries? How do we help people on the mission field get water, drill wells, pump water? So a lot of this, what I'm sharing with you today is stuff that missionaries would love to get their hands on to be able to help people in, all over the world. If you have moving water, water that's not potable, how to take care of it, how to get water out of the ground in, in simple ways that are foolproof, that don't, you know, you go back to the mission field and you see a lot of wells and pumps that are uh, dysfunctional. They're, they were too complicated. So using simple, old school, mechanical things that work. So when you go back year after year, that pump's still running and taking care of that village, that group of people. And then there's a lot of other devices um, that you can use that you have. You know, if you've got an old tractor, you can pump water. I do a, a lot of different mechanical things, but I like to have five or six ways to get water. Because I have customers come to me and say, I want six ways to get water out of that well. Six ways to get water out of that well. So I'm going to go back and scratch my head and you know, figure that out. But, and, and so it's a lot of fun. There are ways to do that if they're willing to spend the money and the time on it. So, um, and then, you know, I started very simple, just store water. So I'm, I'm getting into my complicated side of the talk now of having backup water systems that are um, solar driven. You're charging batteries with solar. I'll talk more on solar tomorrow and how you can have electricity for your location because a little bit of electricity goes a long way. And then my two talks kind of blend together with hot water. Everybody, how many people don't, wouldn't like a hot shower at least once a week in a, in a bad situation? So we're going to talk about those and how that combines. So here I'm just showing a graphic of how to use solar energy to charge batteries, to run motors, to run pumps, to pump water. So I have fun nerd it, geeking out and designing water systems and energy systems for people. And it's so rewarding when they, they don't know what I'm doing, but when the water comes out, they're like, oh, that is awesome. And they're just like, they see that clean water come out of that pipe and like, how? I don't, don't even tell me how, I don't, don't know. But we have to go through and educate them. If something does go wrong, how to fix things. But it is so rewarding to see that, you know, that's, you know, living water. It opens up a lot of doors to witness as well, of course. And um, so it's, it's been very, very rewarding to do these things. Let's talk about purification. I think I have enough time to, to cover that. Um, ways to purify water. I showed you a few. I always carry with me a life straw. All my children, um, anybody can drink out of a straw, so I always like to have some sort of straw type device. But I, this can only get me, you know, get me hydrated, but then if I have to walk a long ways, I like to have some sort of bottle where I can actually carry water with me. So, and having a couple ways to do water is very important. So filtration. It's kind of my number one, it's the easiest thing to do for most people, is buy a water filter. It's kind of the wild west of water filters out there. Everybody makes a water filter. Everybody claims lots of, a lot more water than it really can filter. Um, they're finally standardizing. There's this end-of-life study coming where all water filters will be graded by that. Because you'll see some say a million gallons, 100,000 gallons. Really? Of that bad, nasty pond water, I don't believe it. And so they're doing these end-of-life studies where they bombard the filter with, you know, that same water. And you're just like, okay, that 100,000-gallon filter just got knocked down to 650 gallons. It's more realistic. And those are the numbers that I want to know, that I think you would want to know. What can this thing really do for me? They won't do a million gallons of water of pond water. They're just not possible. So there's a lot of false claims out there. So I'm glad there's kind of an industry standard coming. And so everybody will be graded by end of life filtration. So you'll see the numbers come down and it'll be very good for, for everybody. So you can make your own filters. You can do biosand filters like missionaries do. Um, but if you can buy a decent filter, there's so many. I'm just sharing a few pictures. Um, and then you have to decide, do I need a bacterial filter? Which is most of what we need in North America. We don't have a viral load, praise the Lord, in our water. But if you go someplace where you think there could be viruses, you want a viral filter, which is 10 times smaller. You need, you, know, you need to get into the nanotechnology filters, which actually require some pressure to push that water source through the, through the filter 
because it's chemically etched or however they made that nanotechnology filter to get that good water out of there. And so they, they have, Lifesaver has them in the UK, um, Aquabrick has it now, they're, they're doing viruses. So if you're concerned about viruses with all, you know, the Ebola, the Zika, and you, you just know that you can filter that water with some of the filters that are out there. Again, I showed you a whole house filter. Um, that it's in the lower, lower left-hand corner there. It's a Dalton filter. It has six ceramic candles that you actually pump your water through. They're actually brushable where you can clean them off after a while, and it allows you to do your entire house. So if you don't want to get water in your mouth from your showers and you're running it through the rain catchment, you can keep your, the whole house protected. Then for a cheap solution, let's get into some other ways, just pool shock. I tell people, buy your $3 to $4 bag of pool shock, one pound calcium hypochlorite. It'll treat 10,000 gallons of water. People say, I hate chlorine. I don't want chlorine. Well, you can filter the chlorine out later. You want to kill what's going to kill you in that water source. And for $4, I can treat 10,000 gallons of water. Just make sure it's a super potent solution. You're make, you, you can do it. I'm not going to share with you. I want you to do your own research because I don't want anybody messing this up. You're basically making your own uh, Clorox solution, a 5% calcium hypochlorite solution. Because Clorox is useless after about how long? Anybody know? Five years, that bottle of Clorox that you had on your shelf is zero. It loses 50% of its strength every year. So if you think you're going to take care of your family by storing that Clorox and treating any water by the drop method, eight drops per gallon, you're really going to get people sick. So that's why this is nice. The pool shock can last 10 years in, a, in, its, in its pail, and I can treat a lot of water. If I don't want the chlorine, I can filter it through a Berkey ceramic, or I mean, a, that has carbon, some sort of carbon filtration. You can make your own charcoal. You can filter that chlorine out, but it killed everything that was in there that was going to make you sick. And, and then there's distillation. There's a lot of methods out there just to, you can make your own distilled water. If we get into talking about energy like we will tomorrow, you might need distilled water for your batteries. You might need distilled water for a CPAP machine. You might do distilled water, you might just drink distilled water. I know there's, consp I won't get into that battle if it's good or bad for you, but I like to have the ability to make distilled water. Take any water source and produce good water. You can do that in an off-grid fashion. If you can start a fire, you can make distilled water. And that's another way. There's pasteurization. I don't have to boil the water. I just need to get it up to 165 degrees for, say, 30 seconds, and I've killed everything that's in there. So I don't have to waste my fuel source boiling everything all the time. So purification and I, the calcium hypochlorite, I don't want to confuse anybody because I'm covering a lot of material. But you can use pool shock. Do not get the stuff. Like Walmart has some crazy chemical, the word's this long, it's not calcium hypochlorite. That's what you want to use. That's what is used to treat your municipal water. If you're on city water or county water, they're using basically what I would call pool shock. So with the time remaining, um, I don't think I have much time remaining, we'll talk about transitioning to hot water. There's so many ways to make hot water, but you can't just take your, you know, most people have, how many people have an electric water heater? in their home. Just a standard electric water here. That's how you take a shower. Now that is very inefficient. I'm not going to be able to take the fuelless generator and hook it up to that water heater. Why? Because that element is pulling 4,400, 4,500 watts. Any resistive electrical heating is what you do not want to have in a grid down situation because you're not going to be able to have hot water. But we, because our electricity is cheap, we have these devices that are relatively inexpensive, but when it comes to surviving in a grid down situation, they just don't work. So you have to come up with other ways. So how can I, how can I stay clean? I mean, I can literally, if I can, I, the most primitive is just starting a fire. I always have my stove, I got my stove in my bug out bag, and if I can start a fire with my gasifier stove, I can set a pot on there and I can make hot water and I can, I can stay clean. So that's the primitive way, is just being able to heat water that way. But what if I want to, what if I'm trying to take care of 20 people and I want to give them a shower? How do I do that? So we look at a lot of different ways. There's solar, you know, hot water rises, just simple principle. If I can heat this water, it's rising. So I can take advantage of that with simple solar flat plate. I've had people get coils of black poly pipe, you know, the way they used to heat their swimming pools, just real simple primitive stuff. And, you know, I, at one lady, she didn't have much money. I put a hand pump on her well. And she's like, oh, I just want, how could you, could you please give me hot water? That's all she kept asking me. Can I please give me hot water? I said, okay, I get you hot water. She had a black garden hose, 100 foot long. We hooked it to the end of her hand pump. And by the time we got to the other end, I said, be careful. It would scald her. 
So, I mean, if you want it as simple as that, all I got to do is run water through a black hose in the sun, and I've got hot water. So, you take, you, you, you know, so make hay while the sun shines. We make that hot water during the day, and it's amazing what you can do is there's something that's black. You know, there's, there are solar bags, shower bags you can buy, the campers know about, that you just fill up the bag with water, you place it out in the sun, you aim, angle it up at the sun, and you've got a very hot bag of water that you can wash with and stay clean with. So there's camping gear you might not know about that uses small, uses, uses propane or whatever and give you a hot shower. There's some s systems that have, you know, gas grill, um, regular propane, 20 pound cylinders. And if I got a water source, I've got a hot shower. I've got a hot shower. They don't cost that much money, but sure is nice to have that hot, hot shower. When we went to Katrina and we were the only team, the chainsaw team that had hot showers and clean clothes, it was pretty rewarding for me to just be able to take care of everybody like, like that. And people are laughing, why are you bringing the ringer? Really? And I had the washing machine, the hand crank washing machine, and the hand crank ringer. And we had clean clothes. And to start off the day clean with clean clothes and hit the, and eat a million love bugs all day long cutting wood, you didn't feel you were so nasty by the end of the day. But to do that, refresh yourself every day, it's very, very important. So lots of ways to make hot water. There are old school ways. I've never lived in a house without a wood cook stove. I was raised that way, always had a wood cook stove. Grandmother, I love food cooked on a wood stove. Anybody, amen on that? Anybody have that? <laughs> there's just a taste, there's a way, there's just, it's, it's awesome. You gotta practice, because you'll definitely burn the biscuits if you don't know what you're doing. But a, a wood cook stove is a different animal. But one of, people use wood cook stoves for just heating water, but a lot of them, I put coils in them so I can actually tie, if there's a fire going this is what my Amish friends do and they actually in Kentucky where I get my stoves from they 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 take our old water heaters and they rip the electric elements out because they their church covenant said they can't have AC power because that's of the devil so they take our t storage tanks and they rip the elements out of them and they hook them to their wood stoves and so when they're cooking heating water it's also heating the water the 40 gallon 50 60 gallon water heater so they have hot water while they've made their breakfast and they have hot water throughout the day so it, i learned from the amish a lot and they laugh at us because they're like they're ready to go they they've practiced and they've got it where they know how to stay clean and they they do these use these natural processes of thermosiphoning using wood stoves and it, and it can be done in in your home there's some high-tech stuff there's more high-tech stuff coming I love the technology, because if I can use the technology to help a lot of people, then why not? Because not everybody's going to hand pump, or there's not, it's just, maybe you can't physically do that. Um, so there's some heat pump technology. I can take this blue box called a geyser, hook it up to your electric water heater, and run it off my little solar system, and it's a heat pump, and it uses a fifth, sixth, seventh of the power that my normal water heater is using, and I'm running it off grid. And so the cool thing about that is, if my food's stored in where this geyser is, it's making air conditioning as a byproduct. What it's doing is pulling the heat out of that room, it's putting it into water, and I'm doing it efficiently with solar, and I'm heating that tank of water, and, and I pull the disconnect on my 220 water heating element, so I'm not burning up energy trying to make hot water that way. There's a lot of neat techniques. And then, of course, these on-demand um, propane. If Propane's a great fuel because you don't have to think about it. It lasts forever. And there's a lot of on-demand water heaters out there that can use uh, propane and, and, those, and natural gas to make your water instantaneously. But you've got to have electricity, a little bit of electricity, to run the igniters in those. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of neat ways to make, make hot water. And there's some new things, chillers I'm working on now to run a, like a place like this that would make all the hot water for that kitchen and all the air conditioning for, for the condos all at the same time. So there's some neat, neat technology coming out there. So anyway, I skipped over a lot of the little details. I wanted to save some time if you had any questions. Um, and so if anybody has any questions about water, yes, sir. Yes. Great. You live in a city, you live in an apartment, your only water source is the tap. And as long as that, those tanks are full or the pumps are running and there's electricity in your city, you've got water. Um, I just, a lady called me from Washington, D.C., and she, what do I do? Same exact question this gentleman just asked. And I said, here's what you can do. Can you bury a tank? Can you, this is, we went a little sophisticated with her. She, she got a, and she already had the tank. She got a 1,200 gallon storage tank and put it, buried it in her backyard. And she's filling it, she filled it with city water. 
She filled it with city water. So she's got, she knows at all times she has 1,200 gallons. She's not leaving her place. She's not leaving the city. She's staying in Washington. She doesn't plan on going anywhere. But she has a 1,200-gallon container of water. You can go a long time with 1,200 gallons of water. And so she stored city water. So there's no reason that you can't store city water. Maybe you don't want to go as drastic as dig up your backyard, but you can put, there's plenty, aqua bricks, water bricks, containers. People say, I don't have room. Make room. Make it furniture. You know, your aqua bricks, they stack up and make a table. Cover it up. There, I've got 500 gallons of water sitting there under the, this table I've made up. Cover it with a table. I could, I could stack up 500 gallons of water under every table you're sitting at and from the city water while I have it. The key is, of course, preparedness is thinking ahead. The prudent man sees what's coming and hides himself or prepares himself for what's coming. The neat thing about city water, county water, municipal water, it is already treated. So you don't have to do much to keep it good. So you store it in containers that are BPA-free, polyethylene-type plastic containers. Remember, it's going to be heavy. You're going to be 8.35 gallons per, per 8.35 pounds per gallon of water. So if you if you have a structure, you're not concerned. You know, spread the load out. Um, but if you're in a structure that's very strong, just store it, stack it, hide it, put it in 55-gallon drums. You can buy brand new 55-gallon containers on the internet in many places. Be careful. A lot of people trying to save money, they go out and buy. 55-gallon drums or IBC totes that have had chemicals in them that I can't even pronounce or you can't pronounce. They're just, and they think they're going to flush them. Don't start with that because you do not know what's been in that container. So I found some that had olive oil in them. I found some that had Tropicana grape juice extract in them. I feel pretty safe. That's, you know, an approved container. Rinse it out. Smells a little bit like grape juice, but it's not going to kill me. You know, it's hard to get that, that concentrated smell out of that plastic. And that's what makes me think, well, that chemical's not coming out of that plastic. So start with a good container, whatever container works for you that you can get reasonably, and store that municipal water. And just know, hey, I can make it three months in my apartment using city water, but you have to do it ahead of time. You know, if you know there's a storm coming, a lot of people buy the, the water bobs, the tanks they can put in, their, the bags that you can put in your tub, and you run 100 gallons of water into that water bob. And, and then you have water that way. So it's just thinking, all, all this is is really thinking ahead. It's the sound mind. You're thinking ahead so that there's not fear. If there's any crisis, there's going to be fear. But we have been given a sound mind so that we don't. I just, preparedness is so empowering. I've seen people just absolutely scared to death. Really strong Christian, just scared to death about where, what, the, the world we're living in now. And once they start doing something, just start preparing. Their whole demeanor changed. Their countenance changes. Like, yeah. I can't do anything about the election. I can't do anything about North Korea. I can't do anything about Zika, but I can store water and food for my family and take care of them. And there, the whole mindset changes. Like, okay. And I just like, stop talking about the scenarios and do something. Do something simple. And the fear goes away. They feel empowered. And they start telling other people. It's like the gospel. You have to tell people and stick your neck out and tell them to prepare. They think you're crazy. They're not listening to you. But something will happen in their life Something will happen and they'll be like, oh, Scott told me I needed to do that and I, I'm, I'm going to start doing it. It's neat to see the transition of people I've been watching for the last five, six years. It's very empowering to be prepared. It's, and you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just need to do something. And you can do a lot of stuff by yourself. Yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. For your well or for... Yeah. It's all the way down in the bottom. Um, <laughs> so what, you know, how do you, you, you run the other pump on top of the other? Uh, yeah, good, great question. I think you have a well. It's already got a pump in it, but this plumbing all comes out of the top. And people are like, how, do I, how am I going to do this? How can I put another system in with what I already have? Well, please don't back up your pickup truck to your pump and say, I'll pull that pump out of there and we'll yank it. Because <laughs> people have done that. And what they do is they snap that off and the, well, the pump's stuck in their well and it's a mess. But what you do is you pull up your, your system about three or four feet and you change out what is called a well seal, sanitary well seal, and you put in what is another seal that accepts multiple ports. What's neat about most wells in the United States around here, because I've done several jobs in Missouri, they're six inch, six and a quarter inch wells, and you can fit multiple pumps in there. I've got I'm at Lake of the Ozarks, I did one, he's got, I put two pumps in his, three pumps. He's got his regular grid submersible, he's got a solar submersible that pumps up his mountain, and then, he put, then we put a hand pump in. But the key is that seal on top. You have to do some work. 
of pulling that up and, ch and putting the ports in there so you can get the wires and all these different pumps. And then you put it back down. So in a six inch wheel in Missouri, you can put in three pumps. Yeah, I've done so. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's very rewarding. It's like, now I have backups. I can run that well, I could run that real well pump off of a generator, but I, I don't want to burn up my fuel. So I'm going to run off my solar pump as long as it'll go. And if anything fails and the, somebody shoots my solar panel or it breaks or whatever, I still have my hand pump to get water out of that well. Is that a different type of pump? Yes. It's a 12 volt pump or? No, 12 volt pumps won't usually generate enough power. They're, they're usually into the 24 to 48 volt version. They're variable speed. They're soft start so they don't hurt a solar inverter. And I've got one that'll pump 840 feet, five gallons a minute, solar direct drive, no, no batteries. It's an unbelievable piece of equipment. And, it'll, and that'll cover most any well in the United States, 840 feet down to the static water level. And if you've got a hill, even better. I use, you know, use the resources that you have. What do I have? A lot of, I've got wood, I've got water, I've got elevation, I can use gravity. You, that was my goal when I got my piece of property. Could I live off of the resources that are on the property as a hobby 20 years ago? And that's where I'm at today. I'm like, yes. And so I can basically go around showing people how to take advantage of what you have at your location to take care of as many people. Not only your place, but your neighbors. You know, we set up spigots and things, frost-free hydrants. So as a charity, it's like, maybe you can't come live with us. We don't have enough food. I can't take the food out of my son's mouth and put it in yours, but I can give you water and food and you, you know, send Charity is a hard thing in a difficult situation, but a lot, if you're not charitable now, you won't be then typically. And so what can you do now to help as many people as possible? And you can do it with your well. Yes, sir. A question. Yeah. Okay, the well's here. There's a hill down here. Uh -huh. Is there a way to put like a siphon hose in there and pump it down? It, 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 there only is if your static water level in the well is higher than what's down here. And, and you only know your static water level. Well, it should be on your tag. Another trick is drop a stone through your vent cap it's two feet, 20 feet per second, and so if you're three seconds, you're at 60 feet, you know the difference in elevation change before where you want to take the water and where the water actually is. So siphoning is fun, I do it a lot, but there's some, it's, you, if there's a, these physical principles you've got to overcome that you just, you can't violate certain principles. Okay, yes ma'am. Containers that mm -hmm. you- Storage that, containers? That, well, they're five gallon that you get like Home Depot. I got some of them, but plants in them. Mm -hmm. Are those safe to store water in? Most plastic containers have a, what you're looking for on the bottom, flip it up on the bottom and look and see there's a triangle with arrows and it has a number two in it. That is for potable. Even stuff that's storing industrial chemicals, that a lot of times they'll still put their chemicals in potable water plastic containers. I'm not exactly sure which container it is, but if you look it up sign and you see that too, the HDPE, it's polyethylene, BPA free plastic, you're fine. So you just wanna look for the number two. That's a good place to start. Thank you, good, great question. Got another question over here. Yes, ma'am. I guess we'll wait on the mic. Yeah, several years ago, I put them in milk bottles. And is that okay? And how long can you keep them in there? I, did, I started with milk bottles, low budget, storing uh, water in my root cellar with milk bottles. They just disintegrated. I got, and I'm having a, a confirmation back there, a witness back there. Um, so it's, they don't last. They're just too thin. And they just don't. I haven't had them leak or anything, and I probably had them five years anyway. It, and you're very fortunate because I usually about a year they're starting to come apart, small leaks, and they're leaking. And I might have half of the water left in that. It just leaches out. It's too thin a plastic. I, you know that's why I mentioned the two-liter soda bottle. Um, that that is a much tougher container and works well. And again, with any of these storage, you want them out of sunlight, dark, yeah, that's cool, right. like that's anything basically. we do. If I do batteries, food, water. Me, I want to be in a cool place, dry, and you're going to do it. But the milk, milk jugs, I mean, you're taking your chance. You're, I, I know they're coming for free, but you're taking, you're going to, you could lose it. Okay. I think I'm getting my Times Up card. Overtime. <laughs> okay. Well, it's great to be with you folks. Tomorrow is going to be a lot of a continuation. We're going to talk about energy, a lot of details on how you can make your own electricity. So it's great to be with you folks again, and uh, thanks for coming.
Amen. That was awesome. That was good stuff. Now I see why he's a consultant to National Geographic. That's pretty cool, huh?